Hi there, Justin again. My second video. Please forgive me, the first one was very short and a trial run, so uh, I'm sure you learned something on that. My second video will also be a game by Boris Pasky, the world champion from 1969 to 1972. And as you remember, if you've seen the first one, Spassky beat Bent Larsen when Bent Larsen played the Larsen opening, something that we can't see today. Opening names have been named a long time ago, and to come up with a new opening line is almost impossible. But in the second game, Spassky managed to do it once again. And in this game, in 1973, he had to play in the Russian Open, probably the tournament with the most difficult circumstances to play in because he brought it upon everybody after losing in 1972 to Bobby Fischer that the Russians were furious. They were in charge and in control and dominating chess for many, many years. And all of a sudden, a Russian came and won the world championship from them. So in 1973, everybody in the politics, in the army, in the police, in the government, and in the chess fraternity was involved in the Russian chess championship. And people played in very strict conditions and uh, were well reprimanded on uh, the fact that they had to play properly and that they might have never played outside Russia again. So in this tournament, Boris Pasky won. And I will give you some homework now. I'm not going to tell you who was all in the field, but you are welcome to go and look. Probably one of the strongest chess tournaments ever. And the tournament, as I said, was won by Boris Pasky. And on his way there, he had to play Evgeny Sveznikov, who we all might know as the inventor of the Sveznikov variation in the Sicilian defense. Very popular in South Africa at the moment and in the world. And uh, tremendous for uh, Sveznikov, since he had an advantage of studying this opening. It came as a bit of a su surprise to Spassky. But just playing naturally again, he completely barred, blasted Sveznikov and won quite convincingly. And uh, once again, Spassky shows tremendous middle game skills. The Sveznikov, of course, is e4, c5, knight f3, knight c6, d4. Then the typical Sicilian idea, swapping a flank pawn for a center pawn. So if black can survive, he has two pawns on d7 and e7. The white only has one center pawn left on e4. So black with the right at the right time can push one of these pawns and uh, try and uh, get the initiative or win the move back, as they say, that you down or behind because you are playing black. White makes the first move. So after knight f6, we have to protect our pawn. And now the Sveznikov is playing e5 straight away. Right? We're just lodging white knight that's standing well in the center. And everything becomes uh, quite murky. Of course, today, there's a lot of theory on this opening, but this is still a very good instructive game. The pawn on, on, on D7, D7 is backward, and that is a target for white in many of the variation variations. Black, of course, we'll see, uh, tries to get play down the F file and attacking the center with pawn. So after knight B5, there are some strange variations here, like bishop B4 and so forth. Bishop c5, where you allow the check on d6, but most people play pawn to d6, stopping white from capturing or going into d6 rather, and checking and dislodging either the bishop or black cannot castle. We now have two protectors, the bishop and the queen defending d6. So we are eyeing the d5 square for white. Therefore, the next move by most players, bishop g5, attacking the f6 knight. And after that, Black chases away the knight. The knight goes back to a3 and b5. Now we come at a very big split in the road. White has a choice. Most solid players prefer to play knight d5 in this position. Tactical players and players trying to play for a win from white's side captures the knight straight away. And this is what Spassky does. Bishop takes knight. 
Now, of course, if we play queen takes bishop, the white knight will straight away hop into d5, and uh, that could be a problem. So, we take with the pawn. After taking with the pawn, white now has to decide what to do. And, uh, of course, he's still going to play the same move. Knight to d5, and that knight is planted quite well. Black has the two bishops and some space. Right, I think, my personal opinion, at the top, top level, guys can defend, and white normally stands well in these positions. But it's sometimes a very long road to get there, and there are some very strong players that play the Sveznikov Sicilian these days. And it is playable for somebody who does not want to sit in a passive position for the cost of a few double pawns and a d6 backward pawn, you do get some freedom from black side. So after knight d5 straight away, black tries to get rid of his double pawns and to break up white's center. Now, Spassky plays bishop d3, but preparing to castle and also defending his pawn on e4, after which Sveznikov plays bishop e6. Once again, we see the player with the black pieces. He's only two pawns. He hasn't moved. And even though he's got a lot of pieces around his king, it's going to cost him sooner or later. And white develops by queen h5, putting the f7 pawn, putting an extra attacker on f5, and also making uh, black thinking very hard about any kingside castling ideas, which I don't think is possible at this stage. And uh, bishop g7 and white castles so we'll see now um a black plays h6 i think if he castles straight away we might see a sacrifice with pawn takes f5 push the pawn to f6 and uh, with the bishop and the queen working together towards h7 black might be in trouble so therefore a black plays h6 stopping those ideas but on the other hand He's lifted another pawn. He's got one pawn at home on f7. And uh, there has to be a way for white to get an advantage. Now, in my first video, I said, when you watch these grandmasters, these top-class world champion style, they never have a piece misplaced, right? Now, we have a knight here on a3 that looks to be nothing. But remember, it was forced there by pawns. You can't lose pieces. You can't not put a piece in a bad square if it's your only option because losing pieces, getting behind on pieces is worse than having a misplaced piece. As we will see, this knight returns into the game. White plays c3, stopping knights and pawns coming forward into white's position. And now this knight has a nice plan to maybe join the game via that route. And after c3, black castles. All right, so I said I don't think black can castle. He did. Let's see how long he lasts, okay? So before going on a crazy attack, Spassky decides, let me bring my knight a bit closer and improve its position, then I'll have another piece to help with the attack. Okay, so pawn takes pawn, Sveznikov's moves, uh, move and bishop takes e4. Right, and now what happens? Sveznikov plays f5 and moves his last pawn. So if we look at white's position, he has, once again, only really moved two pawns. All his pieces are in play. His king is safe as a house behind the three pawns where he's castled. And uh, he can look forward to a nice game. Black, on the other hand, yes, he's castled. But he's moved two pawns in front of his castle position. He's moved, moved every single other pawn. And uh, even though his pieces are developed, he has a problem here. And uh, it doesn't take long for Boris Pasky to use the holes in Black's position to get a decisive advantage. And he plays a good move. I will give you a chance for a few seconds to think about what do you think White played on his next move. Think about the center and where the pieces are played, placed and what they can do. While we listen to a bit of Tchaikovsky, who's a Russian composer, so I thought it would be quite good to listen to some Russian music while we have a good look at old Boris Spassky, of course, was a Russian and, uh, yeah, went through very tough times during the Second World War. Tough, tough competitor and uh, 
because of some of the stories we can chat about later, almost didn't make it. Even though he's a very, very strong chess player from a very young age, he beat the then world champion, Mikhail Botvinnik, when he was 10 years old in a simultaneous. That is not easy to do, but he managed to do it, which already showed that he was uh, destined to become a very strong player, which in the end he did by becoming world champion. All right, has anybody found the move? The move played by Spassky was knight f4. A tremendous move. The knight is being hit by the pawn, and the pawn is hitting the bishop. But you can only take one piece at a time. This knight is attacking black's bishop and a fork. And, of course, this bishop is attacking black's knight. And I'm sure that at this point, Sveshnikov was ruining, ruining the fact that he was pushing all these pawns. If the f7 pawn was still at home, the bishop would be guarded. If the b5 pawn was still at home, the knight would have still been guarded. And uh, black might have been able to survive this position. Yes, it's part of the defense to play like that. But once again, um, it's a certain type of player that will play the Sveshnikov. It's not for everyone, and uh, I'm definitely not a fan of it. But there are some strong players that play it, and they get away with it every now and again. So after that move, the best move that Sveshnikov could come up with to save both his pieces was to play bishop d7. So running away from the attack from the knight and going to defend his knight on c6. After that, however, he's dropped the square in the middle of the board, and instantly we have bishop d5 check. Now it becomes a problem for black. Once again, by pushing the f5 pawn, he had to be careful of this diagonal, right? A queen or a bishop on this diagonal, like it happened here, can be very difficult because he's got no minor pieces or pawns to block the check, which means his king is going towards the corner where you don't have a lot of escape squares. And by going away, he went to king h7, king h7, and after king h7, of course, there's a knight fork over here if he goes to h8. But now white goes in with a queen check. At least black cannot be forked by the knight, but he has his king forced to the corner. And in the corner, a king only has three squares to escape, of which two of those squares, this one by the bishop and this one by the queen, are being checked. And black's own bishop is blocking his third escape. So, a very, very tricky position for black to survive. First place we look for a swindle is white's king, but black is never getting there. In other words, black has no play. He's in a desperate situation, and uh, he's not going to last much longer. So, the move played king h8. White plays knight h5. Threatening mate on the move by playing queen takes g7, and black has to do something about it. He plays queen e7, that defends his bishop and connects his rook. rooks. So be careful, even though white's completely winning, we have to be accurate. If we make a mistake, black gets black into the game and uh, we rue our chances. But we have to finish the game. Only when it's checkmate or when our opponent resigns will it be all over. So an interesting move found by white. Knight b4. Also a trait of, of the strong, strong players. If we remember the first game I showed in the first video by Spassky and Larson, Larson completely left his king side alone and got checkmated. And there was past pawns and new queens and he was lost. In this position, Black somehow found a lot of pieces to defend his king, right? But there are four little squares on a chessboard and this time black has forgotten about his queen side maybe he didn't forget about it but he was forced to take his pieces over to the king side and now there's a nasty pin over here and black didn't last much longer he plays knight take bishop and after bishop takes rook we have uh, a lost position he tried to play rook g8 but after pawn takes knight, I think he resigned. He did resign. And, uh, yeah, we can see that black is completely lost. He's down on material. He might be mated. And uh, I think the purpose of um, 
the video was to show you what Spassky can do. And uh, I know that you're all practicing your tactics and your combinations, etc. So the idea was, uh, first of all, to show what caliber of, of player he beat. That he beat two players in their own openings. Okay, So never be scared of somebody. If you're going to be scared of your opponent, you are going to lose very quickly. You must play the position, play the board. If you've done your studying of your opening and you've got experience in it, you have to go with it. Right? You have to go with it and see where it brings you. Yeah, we have uh, Boris Spassky that was surprised twice. Once by Larsen in the first video by B3 and now by the Sveshnikov Sicilian. But he got into decent middle games both times by playing logical openings, going for the center, not pushing too many pawns, castling, and then going on the attack. And won these games very quickly. You know, to win a game in 23 moves against the fellow Grandmaster, it doesn't happen every day. And uh, the guys I'm going to look at in my videos are all capable of doing this. And I think when we're young, which we're aiming at with these videos, everybody likes to checkmate. And everybody likes to checkmate quickly. So, at least, let's look at the games where people checkmate quickly, but they still follow the principles of chess. In other words, the fool's mate is out, those type of funny queen openings, and queens getting out early, that's not what we're going to look at. We can still see that White played a constructive game of chess. He didn't move too many pawns, castle, all the right things. The only piece that didn't move was the rook on a1 and his counterpart on a8 has left the board all right i hope you enjoyed these two little videos and we will definitely uh, improve on them and uh, of course put some uh, feedback in the chat room or phone jean rue or contact the club if you're not happy if you want to some see some something else of course we will do that all right it's out there for you to enjoy chess always must have a little story in my book because uh, a game without a story is not really a formal game of chess. This game was played in the 1973 Russian Chess Championship, won by Boris Pusky, after which he... Sorry, that's Skype call. Let's just ignore it for the moment. After which he moved to France and never ever played really serious competitive chess again. He uh, went on and enjoyed his life. Remember, we're still getting there. He was the world champion and at his best, a phenomenal player. But he lost a bit of oomph after this. He still played some very good games. But uh, winning the 1973 Russian Chess Championship was one of the greatest feats ever. It was a strong, strong field. And uh, I hope some of you return and tell me you played in that field. And you might be surprised at how strong it was. All right, enjoy the rest of your day. Good luck and all the best in the lockdown. Take care. Cheers.